We're good. Hi, I'm Dr. Kevin Windish from Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. Welcome to our series on uh, informational stuff for professionals, for either healthcare professionals, residents, medical students, nurse practitioning students, physician assisting students. Uh, our office can be reached at area code 775-359-7111 or you can find us on Facebook at Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. Today, we're going to review how to perform a cranial nerve exam on an adult. This can be adapted for use in kids and in infants, uh, but it's a much coarser exam with the, the young ones. My assistant Angela has been kind enough to volunteer for us, so we're going to start. Cranial nerve 1, the olfactory nerve, is actually very difficult to test. Uh, patients who complain of anosmia or alterations in smell sense, there's actually standardized sense that the patients are supposed to be able to smell when a neurologist will have access to those standardized scents. Typically we rely on patient report. In pediatrics that's very difficult because many of our patients will not report that they can smell or not smell or have alterations in smell. Many of my patients can't speak, so that's a difficulty. Cranial nerve 2, the optic nerve. Uh, we're going to start with a fundoscopic exam. Now, ordinarily, this is done with the lights off to dilate the pupil, but that makes for lousy videography, so we're going to do it with the lights on, even though you can't really see anything. Okay, so I'm going to have you just pick a spot on the wall and keep looking forward there. And we're just going to look in, and we're going to look at the fundus, which is the second cranial nerve coming into the retina. We're going to look for retinal, or cranial nerve size, we're going to look that there's no pressure around the optic disc. Okay, the next step, and again this is typically done in a darkened room, will be to test the visual part of the pupillary right light reflex, so we'll just shine a light in our eyes and make sure that the pupils constrict. Again, this doesn't work so well in a lighted room, but it makes for better video. So that's cranial nerve 2. Cranial nerve 3 is going to include pupillary constriction. This is the muscle phase of the light constriction. So if she has normal, well actually I guess we'll go back to cranial nerve 2 for a second. We would test a Snellen on her do visual acuities, which I'm not going to do here. And then we're going to test visual fields. So I'm going to have you cover one eye. Okay, now if this needs to be done in tremendous detail, we can actually use a machine in an ophthalmologist's office to do this. But to get a gross exam at the bedside, I'm going to just have you with comfort, we do this, we call this with confrontation. I'm going to have you tell me how many fingers you see. Three. Okay. Four. Okay, that tests both the vertical and horizontal fields. We'll switch eyes. Okay, very good. So now on to cranial nerve 3. We've already tested the constriction, so the next thing we're going to go ahead and test for her is just her ability to open her eyes. So I'm going to have you open your eyes real wide. We're going to notice that both eyes are symmetric and that both brows are symmetric, although some of the brow raising is actually 7th cranial nerve. We're next going to test ocular eye motion. So I'm going to have you just look at my finger up here. So up and out, okay, and in, and down, and in, Okay, now I'm going to have you follow my fingers in. Now this is actually going to check cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6. Remember the abducens is responsible for pulling, that's the 6th cranial nerve, pulls your eye out laterally. And the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve 4, pulls your eye down and in. So that motion is 4th cranial nerve, lateral deviation of the eye is 6th cranial nerve. 7th uh, cranial nerve, we're going to test facial features. Actually, I guess we'd skipped fifth cranial nerve. So we're going to look at fifth cranial nerve has two functions. One is motor, so I'm going to have you just clench your teeth, okay? And then I'm going to have you open big for me. Okay, good. So we've got good jaw motion, and she has normal symmetric masseter muscles. There's no obvious masseter atrophy. So that tells me that nerve is functioning, at least on the motor function. Cranial nerve 5 is also responsible for... Uh, smell of one particular substance, and that is, that's ammonia. So if you have a patient who's complaining of anosmia and you're concerned that this is maybe some kind of um, secondary gain, you can test them with smelling salts. If they complain they cannot smell that, those are separate cranial nerves and they're, they're separated by quite a distance in the brain. So something that would affect cranial nerve 1 and cranial nerve 5 is slim to nothing. Okay, so let's see, what else? And then we're going to just test sensation on the face. So I'm going to have you close your eyes. Ideally, this is done with a cotton swab. But I want you to just tell me if you can feel my finger now. 
No. No? All right, how about now? Yes. All right, and now? No. And now? No. And now? Yes. And now? No. And now? Yes. And now? Yes. And now? No. And now? No. And now? Yes. And now? No. And now? No. And now? Yes. Okay. I'm not going to bring a cotton swab out because I'm just going to cheat a little bit and be reasonably fast here. Okay, so that's cranial nerve 5, cranial nerve 6. We've already tested cranial nerve 7. Have you close your eyes real tight? Okay, this affects eye closure. Now I'm going to have you show me your teeth. You can open your eyes back up. And show me your teeth big. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, and then I'm going to have you, let's see, this one's not always so easy for patients to do. I'm going to have you just tighten the muscles in your neck. Okay, and you can look at um, the non-strap muscles in the neck, but we're not getting real good platysmus constriction from Angela. That's okay. Cranial nerve 8 is your acoustic nerve. We're going to test hearing, which we use autoacoustic submissions here to test. We can test vestibular function if we need to with Dick's Hall pipe maneuvers, but that's a separate video for another day. Cranial nerve 9. Oh, and cranial nerve 7, of course, provides uh, taste of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, which we could test if we needed to. Cranial nerve 9 is going to be responsible for taste of the posterior one-third of the tongue, and it's responsible for a gag reflex. I promise I won't gag you too bad. This is for video. I don't need to actually torture you. So this provides sensations. So we'll open big. All right, and we would... Okay, and that was a little bit of gag for you there. Okay, at that same time, while I'm doing the gag, you notice I shine a flashlight in there so that I can look and see if her soft palate retracts in the midline, because that's cranial nerve 10. Uh, and your soft palate should retract in the midline. If your soft palate retracts only on one side, you have a unilateral cranial nerve 10 palsy. Um, cranial nerve 11, I want you to just look out towards the door there, okay, and then look back over this way, okay, and then tilt your head to one side, good, and the other side, and we can test muscle as well, but I'm really just looking for um, the ability to, to control the nerves at this moment and see you shrug your shoulders. Way up, come on, you're not paralyzed, good, and then stick your cranial nerve 12, stick your hypoglossal nerve, stick your tongue out. We're making sure your tongue protrudes in the midline, not off the one side. Okay, and there's no fasciculation of the tongue and there's no atrophy of one side of the tongue. Those are your cranial nerves for adults. Now, for kids we can adapt some of this because we can uh, provide doll's eyes maneuvers to check extraocular eye motions. And you can have the child watch and track his parents as they move across the room. Pupillary constriction and fundoscopic exam is unchanged. So that's cranial nerves 2, 3, 4, and 6. Cranial nerve 5 is... Uh, actually very difficult to test uh, in, an, in an infant because you just you're doing sensation testing for the vast majority of it and you're not gonna not gonna be able to do that. Cranial nerve 7 is gonna be mostly looking for nasophilabial fold symmetry okay and if you can get the child to open their mouth or cry you'll look for a grimace when they cry and their face should be symmetric. Cranial nerve 12 they won't stick their tongue out for you but you will be looking for atrophy. Cranial nerve 9 and 10, you can definitely gag them and watch for soft palate retraction in the midline. Cranial nerve 8 can be tested with otoacoustic emissions testing, and visual fields and visual uh, acuity can be tested with um, um, brainstem, audio, or, um, brainstem visual evoke response testing. Uh, in infants, it's just important to know we wind up doing a lot more scanning of the central nervous system because we can't do the more complicated testing that we're able to do here on an adult. This is Dr. Kevin Windish. This is part of our educational series for professionals. If you have questions, if you'd like to schedule a rotation, please call us at 359-7111. That's area code 775. Uh, or uh, find us on Facebook, Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. We'll see you next time.